Yeah, when I was a little boy sitting. Hello, welcome to Going Deeper. My name is Marcy Sklove, and today I'm sitting with Earl Miller. Earl is the new director of the brand new department in Amherst, Massachusetts called CRESS. And that stands for Community Responders for Equity, Safety, and Service. CRESS is a great, a great acronym. So, welcome Earl. Thank you. I'm very excited to be sitting with you. Glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we will unfold about yourself and about the program and everything. And how I often like to start these interviews is to ask about your early life hmm. and just what in your childhood and your coming up in the world sort of informs the work you do today and your philosophy and your passion, yeah. whatever you want to say about that. Yeah, I, you know, I grew up in a really scary place for most of my, my very young life. And I think the way that shaped me was there were lots of places in life where I felt unloved. There were lots of places where I felt like uh, what happened to me didn't matter to anybody but me. And so, you know, I kind of lucked into human services. I, I got my first job because I couldn't get a job at the, the Dunkin' Donuts on Main Street in <laughs> Springfield. And so I ended up doing peer support. But what's kept me in it is sometimes I think we can get so caught up in the pain of struggle that we forget that it's often when people are their best. And in doing this work, I have seen people survive things that felt unsurvivable. I've seen people be compassionate in places where uh, mm. nobody had any right to ask anything of them. Um, and I'm reminded of, of why it's important to talk about people who aren't at the table, not just because it would be good to have those folks there, but because they have something to offer the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and. You know, I, I grew up in a lot of different places. I was a foster kid for a long time, but I think of Holyoke as home as the place I mm -hmm. felt the most at home. Uh, and that place informs me every day. I, I still want to be Aaron Vega when I grow up. I, you know, I still, um, I think of the work these men and, and people, lots of women, uh, did to make that community a place that even when it didn't feel safe, still felt like home. Mm. Uh, and so. You know, that's mostly how I think of the work is uh, is wanting to bring just compassion and love in places where that might not always be present and to people who might not always feel included. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, this is sort of on the spot, you might not think of something, but is there like a time or an event or something that happened that gave you inspiration? Yeah, I, um, so when I turned 13, uh, my mom moved out of state and I was already in, I was in a hospital and I, you know, got this news kind of on my birthday mm -hmm. and I, I had a, a really hard day and it, this is, it, I don't know how inspiring the story is to other people, but it has driven my life in a lot of ways. I ended up in this uh, room for kind of like a safety room, which is uh, a modern padded room. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a staff on the unit who was terrible. He did not care about his job. He would read the newspaper in the middle of it. Yeah. Um, but I was in this place where I was gonna come into conflict with staff and he came in before them. And what he told me was, you know, it's not always gonna feel like this. Um, mm. And those, I think, are the most inspirational words I've ever heard is, wow. no matter how bad today is, it won't always be like this. And I appreciate the honesty because what he didn't say is it's gonna be better. Mm -hmm. But it'll be different, mm -hmm. and I can survive this moment right. if it'll be different sometime. Right, and certainly, how the hell would he know if it's going to be better yeah. or not? So then, it it doesn't sound true. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's really um. Yeah, that's a moment when I understand that it doesn't sound inspirational to someone else, but that in fact it's those little yeah. honesties and truths. Yeah. So. Okay, let's dive into Cress. Tell me, how, first start with like, how did the idea emerge? Where, where did it all, how did it unfold? Yeah, so I think one of the things that makes Cress really distinct is that it wasn't a response to a local issue. It was a response to this larger national conversation after the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. um, and 
Uh, you know, one of the things I'm, I really, before I took this job, I watched all the community safety working group, and those folks are uh, really important to me, and I think they're incredibly important to the community. Um, and them, along with the public safety apparatus and the town manager and the town council, had these incredibly challenging conversations about yeah. what, you know, I think like all of them, it started from a place of how does policing need to be different? Mm -hmm. And a lot of communities stop there because that conversation is uncomfortable, mm -hmm. it's hard. Um, but they pushed past that to the idea of, well, what could be different? Um, and I, I like that. I like the idea of there's a better idea, not just a bad idea. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. uh, the better idea was that, um, you know, across the country there have been programs like Star in Denver, Cahoots, mm -hmm. um, that have tried this idea. Um, one of the really distinct pieces of Crest is that we're town employees. Mm -hmm. um, wow. So we are a public safety department on par with the police department and fire department, um, responsible for public safety and responsible to public safety. Um, like it, it's, I, I encourage folks, if you have lots of time, it's an epic, watching these videos is, uh, yeah. you see all the moments where a lot of communities quit because yeah. it became us versus each other and nobody wants to fight their neighbors, particularly not when we're talking about things like racism and totally. how the police are experienced by different communities. Um, so in Amherst, we look to solve kind of really a few questions with this. One is kind of, does this community response work? Is mm -hmm. it wanted? And we'll figure that out through the work. The other idea is, does this idea work in a small town? Because mm -hmm. we are by far the smallest town to try wow. this idea. Wow. And then, does it work with a collaborative effort? So as opposed to some where, you know, we are an alternative 911 response, but we'll also be collaborating with the other public safety entities sure. um, to gain the value of their wisdom and, and to partner for this shared goal. So. Um, I think that collaboration will get us there, but it is a great experiment, and, yeah. uh, and we're gonna let the work figure out if we're right. So one of the things, okay, full disclosure, I um, am the chair of the Racial Justice Committee of the League of Women Voters, and we very much supported the CSWG Community Safety Working Group. So I did attend some of those yeah. meetings and, and watched. Yeah. Um, and as a white person watching, it was really interesting to like push through the reactivity I might be feeling or my worry of other white people, what they'd be feeling, and just listen, and that in the middle of what might sound like a rant would be this brilliance and full like um, analysis of what's going on. And so it was so, you're right, people should watch those videos. They were, they were an amazing set of, for learning, for white people too, to be learning from, you know, hearing directly from people. Um, and I know one of the issues that came up a lot was the notion of being its own entity versus being like having a community responder in a, in a cop car going to you know to a call how did that evolve like where did where did that come out yeah so the idea is that you know part of our challenge is that there are some folks in the community particularly black men who have lots of reasons historically to be suspicious and to not want police response um, and if crest had been a uh, kind of division of the pd which is what some communities are attempting, exactly. and maybe it'll work, we'll find out, right? Um, but the idea is that they could reach out to us separately from the police. So yeah. we'll have a, a, a number that is separate from all those things where someone could call for support. Um, it allows us to kind of define our own work, um, which appears to look a lot like social work. It appears to look a lot like uh, community peer support. Um, that's what we're hearing from folks. Um, and that Putting us in a car would have made us another resource that worked well for people who received the police well. I see. And so for those folks who were already on the fringes of getting support, sure. they would have continued to be. And I'll, I'll say one of the great parts about this is that uh, Chief Livingstone at the Amherst PD is, is a, a humble and thoughtful mm -hmm. and, and kind and compassionate man because it would have been easy for him to get upset with us for this not to work. And he's thrown his full support behind wow. us. That's and so, good to hear. you know, part of this isn't that, you know, there's a need for a separate uh, entity, 
but not one that is so separate that it doesn't collaborate exactly. or that we're not able to make all of our lives better. So that's one of the things I'll say that it's important to talk about these kind of hard notions of policing. But, you know, I think that one of the one of the unique pieces about this is we have a police department that is not just receptive, but is all in on supporting that's us. That's fantastic. That is really fantastic. And I read in the paper just this week, I think, that you have now fully hired your responders. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and really lucky. We didn't have a deep pool of folks, but the people who came in really came in full hearted. They came in. So can yeah. you say a little more about like not specifically yeah. who they are, but generally? Yeah. So they're a lot of residents of the town, which was important to us that we, these ideas that were defined by the community of Amherst, I don't live in Amherst, and so mm -hmm. it's always really important to me to remember that, you know, keeping that community at the core of this is, is, is one of the ways we, we, we thrive. Um, there, there are people willing to go on an adventure. This is an adventure. <laughs> um, there are parents in our community. There are wow. uh, some folks who are coming. This is going to be a couple people's first job ever. Um, but they're compassionate, and they have shown a desire to help people. Um, we asked folks about volunteering. We asked them about what do they do to make their community better. Um, but these are all folks who, you know, one of the things that was really important to us is that we we really wanted kind of an enthusiastic consent. We wanted folks who really wanted to be a part of this. So at several parts during the interview process, we would stop and ask someone, are you still interested in this position? Mm -hmm. Defining it the way we did. And everybody that we hire has identified that they're excited by this idea. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I look for is a little bit of how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I wake up, I was just telling uh, our new program assistant who I drove over here with, that I wake up every morning terrified I, I bolt up I, wow. I'm, bo I'm immediately afraid they're like oh my god I've agreed to do this thing what if it doesn't work uh, but the second thought is like mm. when was the last time someone got to feel this like when was the last time someone got to redefine public safety mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. build a department the last time we did it in Amherst there were horses and buggies wow. it's been a long time yeah. so yeah. Uh, I get scared and then very excited yeah. and I want folks who are smart enough to be scared because you should be a little nervous, sure, sure. Um, but brave enough to be excited by that fear, and, uh, yeah. and that's that's really. It's easier for me to say I was looking for this little piece of myself that I feel, and uh, and we sure. found it in all nine of them. The wow. eight responders were hiring and cat. Oh, that's fantastic! That's fantastic. So, in the in the bigger news of the of the country, you know, there's um, horrible, horrible shootings that happened recently. And you're hearing, you know, I'm hearing more about crime on the rise. And recently, I don't know all the facts of this, but I was hearing about new uh, politicians who are campaigning in very progressive places to be more conservative and more like, let's get deeper into policing. Yeah. So, like, what? I mean, in my mind, I have a total rationale about yeah. why this kind of approach yeah. is way better yeah. in every way. Like, had somebody been with that shooter in yeah. Valde, like how somebody was with you, yeah. who knows how that yeah. person could have been transformed. Okay. But, like, are you hearing any sort of like, okay, you know, let's just wait and see how this goes. Are you feeling that in Amherst? Yeah, um, I would say not so much. Yeah. We're really lucky in Amherst in that I think, I think the town did those conversations. There mm -hmm. was that two year long conversation. So I think everybody has ideas on what success will look like mm -hmm. and some of those don't agree. Um, but I think everybody wants it to work. And I think to your, to the, that initial point about getting tougher on crime, it just doesn't work. It doesn't yeah. work to warehouse human beings. It doesn't work. Right. Um, and it builds these inequities in. And for, for someone from Holyoke, the one that kind of I always have to speak to is that I grew up during the crack epidemic, yeah. which was not treated like an epidemic. There were right. uh, people who I love a great deal were removed from my life for long periods of time they were not made better people, they were not empowered, they were not educated, they were not reformed. They were returned to us as though they had left in a time machine, except that time machine had just been trauma. It doesn't work. 
and with substance users, which is I think where you hear it a lot lately yeah. is um, you can't punish someone into not being homeless. And when people are substance users, when you take <coughs> away everything in their life and you, you know, take away their ability to get a job and to have kids, their, their children with them and to live indoors, uh, that is why people end up using drugs until they die. So it's, it's less about saying like, will this thing work? But these other things haven't worked. No. There doesn't seem to be a way to uh, incarcerate away our social ills. And yeah. we know that, you know, that even in school shootings, right, we, we hear all these narratives about a good guy with a gun. And, and I do think that in Amherst, the PD would have went into the building. I trust these people. I, I have to believe that. Um, but I also think that if you look at the data on what stops these things, far more of them are stopped by an unarmed, concerned person yeah. in the building who, who de-escalates it yeah. than by someone with a gun shooting into it. Right. Um, and so, you know, what I tell folks is, um, A, look at the data. We have the LEAP report, which is yeah. available on the town website, which answers a lot of these questions about why we exist. Um, but watch the work, and we're going to make sure we do the work in front of people. We're not. Yeah. This isn't a secret. We want to be. We want folks to understand our training and what we're doing and our intentions. And you know, we're not going to solve every problem, but we're going to solve a couple of them. And yeah. and even if some of those are just being there for people in hard moments, I think that'll have some value. It's part of why us being a government entity is important. Yes. Um, government solves issues that the private market can't for a lot of reasons. And Cress isn't necessarily something that's going to bring in a lot of money. No. It's not going to. We're not going to generate any money, really, frankly, at least at the beginning. But we know that there's a lack of compassion in our folks. And after two years of, of the pandemic, that folks are, are, are thirsty for someone who is compassionate and caring and really listens to them to understand them. And we're going to do that. That's yeah. the thing we'll be best at on day one. The rest of it we'll figure out. But we'll care deeply about everybody the first day we start. So you've already started that. I love the story that you shared. Um, about when you went to talk to the library staff. Do yeah. you want to tell that story? I love that. Yeah, so I went and met with uh, Sharon Sherry, who uh, has a be the best name and is one of the <laughs> nicest people I've ever met. And really, you know, there were some concerns at the library. There were some challenges. Libraries are really the last sanctuary people have. Right. They're the last place that anybody can go into that'll let you use the restroom, that'll give you some water and talk to you. And so that invariably means that sometimes they end up with, in the conflict with people who don't run into many other people. And you know, we talked about what their issues were. And one of their main issues was closing up at the end of the day. OK, but let okay. me stop you there, okay. because the way you asked the staff. Is that, how, can, how, can we, what, how can we help you? What's what can, the hardest hour of your day? That was the question, yeah. which I loved, because they were yeah. not expecting yeah. to be asked something like that. Yeah, we, that's, you know, that's what we've asked everybody. What's the hardest part of your, your right. work life, and what could we do that would make an impact in it? And, yeah. and for them, it was this closing up, and so we're developing a shift change operation that'll happen at that space at the library. And so, you know, frankly, it'll be good for us to meet folks as, okay. as the library is closing, and anything we can do to let librarians be librarians for their whole shift and, and also, it, what I was really taken with was that at no point when the library folks were explaining this to me, were they blaming the folks? Sure. Were they saying, and what they were saying is, we have this challenge and the only option we have to us right now is to invite a person with a gun. Yeah. And you know, that, I, I often think about policing more like that because I, I like the folks we have. And even my best friend, I wouldn't want showing up with a gun to a right. conflict that I was engaged right. in, particularly when they didn't need that. Right. And so, you know, they, you know, and, and it's, it's funny because one of the really interesting parts about these conversations that happened before, before me was that people all have these dreams of Crest. And I think a lot of folks felt like, well, I'm not going to ask. It's silly. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing mm -hmm. this thing. And really, the opportunity here is what, what problems can we solve? There's a, uh, a you know, I got a call from a school yesterday. I'm going to uh, drive a kid to school next week just to, just to be supportive. Like, yeah. those are things that don't cost anything. It means sure. I get to meet a human being, and we right. solve a problem for folks. And, right. uh, and I've been lucky enough that I've been able to do that for the 10 weeks I've been here wow. and, um, and build a little bit of a roadmap to, I think, you know, what would it be like to just be helpful? Yeah, and for me, it was such a breath of fresh air when I heard the story because it's not just all the things you said. But it's like hearing a situation and solving it yeah. and having an answer that doesn't 
create a problem or it, it's just such a win-win kind of thing. It solved the problem for me, which is where are we going to do shift change? Exactly. And now we can do it there at the library. It's a beautiful space. It's, it's a fantastic. historical space. Yeah. yeah. I think there's I think there's a world in which we can all move through it. And yeah. for the people there, they're yeah. going to meet us. And if they need a ride home or they need some sort of assistance, we're able to offer that. And the library has really tried to do things way above, outside of their right. of their means. Sure. Uh, and and I, I respect them so much. I'm so glad to be of yeah. service to them. Yeah. So... Um, there was this training you and I were both in, and I just wanted to speak to something that I experienced in you, which was an, a very deep knowledge about history and sociology and like connecting dots between different aspects of history and different things that go on in labor mu movements or labor unions and all these different things. How do you know all of that? What's your What's yeah, been your education? I'm a dork. That's really it. I, <laughs> I, 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 I was not someone who was very successful in high school. I, I read a lot, but um, I didn't have much of a stable home life. And sure. so I never finished a school year in the same school that I started it in. Yeah. So I didn't have that sort of consistency. Um, but I like to learn, and I find history particularly interesting. And uh, I got mentored by a woman named Michael Ambusey in Springfield, oh, yeah. and she really hammered into you know me, Jesse Letterman in Springfield. There's a few of a few of her wow. acolytes rolling around here. She really hammered into us that most problems we experience as a society have been solved before. Um, you know the idea of how do you deal with violence in our community. Well, you look at like the early 1900s in New York and the gang violence you have, and the solution to that was a lot of the stuff from you know the Great Depression, the the, the New Deal, the idea yeah. that like your government is going to work for you, your government is going to do things like the FDIC, and mm -hmm. and and do things that are not money generating, but that ensure that you can feel safe. That mm -hmm. um, you know mental health. The most successful mental health system this country's ever had was the Quakers in the 1800s wow. when it was about... Say more about that. Resp yeah, so their, their approach was they would, um, they would have these beautiful houses and they would have people dress in kind of their, their Sunday best. And when people experienced distress, they, they would put them in the warm baths or you know, feed them, or these things that were kind of re-emerging. When you look at the Peer Respite in Northampton, mm -hmm. the Wildflower Alliance, the things they're doing, so many of those things are a return to this idea of what do you do, um, but you can't bill for that. There isn't an insurance sure. billing, there isn't a medication that solves that. Mm -hmm. And so as we like made mental health care and, and self-care like this industry, we took away this thing that was just like, no, just what works for you. Right. And, and how can you, right. and so, you know, I think history is really important, particularly as a, a black man in America, it's been really important for me for, uh, to understand the nuance of it, yeah. um, that it can be so easy to paint things with a broad brush. And uh, one of the things I've been learning a lot about recently is the way in which like the civil rights movement of the 1600, uh, 1960s really excluded LGBT people, that there mm -hmm. were there were gay black men who participated in the planning of the uh, of the, the the march on Washington who never got the credit for it oh. because they were rebuffed by the church and so yeah. how do you undo those those wrongs and for me it means to be as good of an ally to those communities as I can mm -hmm. and to make sure that when I when I take ideas from their community that I always give them the credit and invite mm. them to the table because yeah. that hasn't historically happened. So uh, I, I really I like reading. Uh, I'm a big autobiography guy. I read uh, yeah. Mal Malcolm X's speeches from his last year. Was my, my mom got me that when I was like 12 because oh I just gosh. like I, I just I think for me. I don't have much of a family, mm -hmm. so kind of throwing myself into history makes me feel like a part of something bigger totally. than myself. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's kept me from making some bad moves, so, so I'll keep wow. doing it. Do you have a spiritual connection that way that makes you feel connected to something larger? Yeah. I, I, I think I, I'm trying to figure this piece out because it's a really complicated one. I, I think of myself as like a humanist. Like yeah. I think, I think I find all religion really interesting because I think we get we can get so caught up in these battles of what's true and not, but people base their whole lives on these things. So they're true to the regard that a human being is building their structure of living around them. So I'm, I'm intrigued by that. Um, and I, yeah, no, I, I, you know, I, I would say I'm probably closer to growing up Catholic, closer mm -hmm. to that. When things get hard, I'll go to mass. But I, for me, I feel most most at home with the universe 
just in conversation with other people. Yeah. Like hearing about someone, you know, the idea that someone could have an entire rich life and we've never intersected past until this moment mm. is interesting to me. And yeah. how people think about themselves is really interesting. One of the things I find really interesting about Amherst is I, I sometimes hear people describe the community and I want to take them like a step away from it and yeah. just like, there's not a bad view in town. We were driving in here, we drove past a field of cows. Yeah. And just in this moment, I'm like, <laughs> I, you know, I'm a kid from Holyoke. I never thought that I, I would get, we're going to be at the Munson Library. It has this mm. amazing view of the, that, yeah. South Amherst is just beautiful. enjoying the idea that like, you're in a beautiful place where most people care. And, and there isn't anybody here who's irredeemable. Like, mm -hmm. maybe we could enjoy... We, well, maybe I could think of one. No, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> See, that's the other thing. Is that the other thing, uh, you know, I... I no, I, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. I learned this thing early in my career. This um, Sarah David out there, RLC told me this, and it's always rang true for me, the Wildflower Alliance now, okay. was that, you know, nobody wakes up and decides they're going to do less than their best. Everybody mm. thinks, given the context of their lives, the experience they have, that they're doing the things that are moving them forward. And when that falls short, it's a disappointment. Yeah. No, nobody yeah. wakes up and thinks the municipal government is going to have to come provide me emotional support. Right. So when it happens, treating it with the respect that, you know, this was not part of someone's plan and the dignity of yeah. that is, yeah. yeah. I, I, I like no, people. I, yeah. yeah. There's also a beautiful line I heard recently. I think it was one of the parents of Sandy Hook kids after the Uvalde thing. And she said, there's no such thing at, how did it go? There are good people and there are good people in pain. Yeah. There, implicit in that was there's no such thing as a bad person, yeah. but that wasn't the, the quote. It was there are good people and there are good people in pain. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things I really, I find really interesting is, you know, I know not everybody in town has time to stop and have conversations with folks, and that's a huge privilege I have. Mm. Um, but there are some, like the homeless folk, the, the unhoused folks in, in Amherst, I, I often say homeless because I was homeless. Yeah. And when I was homeless, I was homeless. I did not have a home. I know, but isn't home un unhoused in some way like just removing, it, it, it's, I don't know that I, I like the I, term, um, actually. For, for my lived experience, I yeah. don't. Because I, I yeah. was, I recognize that there are some home, some folks who do not have housing who feel like they have community. And for them, that may that makes sense. I did not have community. I lived in a park. Yeah. I, I went to a YMCA to get dressed every morning. And like in that space is the worst, the, the scared, most scared I've ever felt. And I remember just thinking like, I wish somebody, I wish there was someone who I could just tell what was happening. Yeah. And there wasn't, I had a job and I had to, and when I talk to folks about how they ended up homeless, like it's amazing how many of us are a couple bad days away from that. They lost yeah. a job, they right. suffered an injury, they developed a substance use uh, addiction, generally after medication that was properly prescribed to them, uh, or they were incarcerated and their discharge from that jail just kind of dumped them on the streets. And yeah. so it's heartbreaking because you sometimes think, well, they never had a shot at all, yeah. but maybe we can give them one. Yeah, yeah. And that just starts with having authentic conversations. Yeah. It's that it, simple. I don't think there's any problem in this country yeah. that wouldn't be improved by people like yeah. having real conversations, not the kind of performative debate right. that right. kind of politics have become, but right. like really, why do you feel this way? Why do right. people feel that they need to have 37 guns in their house? What are you right. scared of? What are right. you so afraid of? And. And, you know, and I think it's important that when we talk about why Crest exists and why black men in general may fear the police, it's like I've been there. I've been stopped and frisked in Springfield. Yeah. I know what it feels like to come out of a store and have someone throw you up against the wall and empty your pockets oh, out and, and do that in front of your community. Do that yeah. in front of the people you go to church with or the people and the way it, it strips you away. And I also know what it's like for people, I also know what it's like to watch my entire life black men be brutalized and murdered on TV yeah. and for nothing to happen. To feel yeah. like, you know, if that was someone who looked differently experiencing that, we would change oh, totally, laws, totally. we would do things. And, you know, it's it's heartbreaking. And and, and sometimes you need to just say that stuff. I, my, yeah. You know, my experience in watching the George Floyd tape was I waited because I thought, you know, I didn't want to watch it if people were going to stop being invested in it yeah. uh, a couple of days in. but. 
how easily the day can get away from you, how easily the moment can get away from you, and how much, I hope every police officer I run into is good, and I wish I didn't have to hope so hard all the time. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that you said earlier about it being a municipal, Crest being a municipal department, is that that's what I'm looking for. It's, it's about institutional change. Yeah. That it, yeah. it's really changing the structural stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and we're building and an you institution. Can't, it's not yeah. about money. Yeah. It's not about how can we make yeah. money on this. And it's also about letting go of old institutional yeah. structures. Yeah. And that's a big, you know, that's, I, I think about that all the time. That what we're building is, is bigger than me. It's bigger than the people who will come in. If we do our jobs right, it will outlive us. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to that point, it really means being really thoughtful about the decisions mm -hmm. and being open to the idea that you're wrong. You right. know, like, I'm, I am not uh, a deity. I am doing the best with the information right. I have. And if more better information comes in that we should go in a different direction, sure. I'm open and glad for it. Um, and it was important to the town, too, that our folks are union employees. These are good oh, wow. union-paying jobs. Oh, that's um, really So that cool. they also have the protection of a union. It's not sure. just the town protecting them. They also have that. Um, and that's that they pay great. a living wage. Yeah, yeah. And you also once, I heard you say something, and not to get grandiose mm -hmm. in your expectations, but... I like that, to get grandiose. <laughs> but that this, you know, potentially could be a model. Yeah, we already have other municipalities reaching out to That's us so to great. learn from us. They're they're reading through reports. They're, you know, we we have a lot of eyes on the work we do, and that's a that's an important pressure. Uh, it's not one we're going to shy away from. Right. Um, we there can't be any secrets in this. No. We, it's and the right humility that you always bring to it, like we're going to fail, we're going to make mistakes. Starting with that, yeah. that opens the door for you know lower expectations and not being perfect which you yeah. know stuff is going to come up yeah i mean that's yeah. what when people ask what a responder is like ultimately if, if i do my job well it'll be a human there'll be a full yeah. human being who is honest with people about what hey i don't know but let's figure it out together let's right. let's do this together and um and that the kind of principles the ideas that People are, are, are good in that people who are struggling uh, just need support, just need compassion, right. and real compassion, right? Not just like, well, I feel bad for you, I'm gonna go yeah. about my day, but I feel, bad, I feel bad that this is where you are, and I'm right. gonna invest time and energy into helping shift that for you. Yeah, and also a sense that it's not your fault. Yeah. You know, like, there's a movie called Sea Biscuit. That, uh, do, you, do you know yeah, that movie? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what I love, the takeaway for me of that film is that it, it describes the depression. And the way it's spoken about is that there, these were good people down on their luck. And somehow along the way, poverty got turned into you, you are wrong. You did a bad thing. You are poor because you can't, you know, you can't yeah. handle it. You can't manage, yeah. whatever. And I love going back to that sense that these, you know, people who need mental health help or support in any way, they're down on their luck, you know, as opposed yeah. to you're a bad person. Yeah, and, and more so now than ever, it is harder to get mental health care. Yeah. People are taking multiple trips to the hospital before they're admitted or a bed is found. Yeah. Um, and, and really, you know, Part of my life that feels really important to this is I, my first jobs were in factories. Um, and the thing you always learn there is everybody here is one bad twist, one bad turn away from being unemployed. And, and the idea of like, well, then it'll be our responsibility as a group of folks to help out. Um, and yeah. that, that the reality that even folks with a lot in our community are probably not as far removed from poverty as they believe themselves right. to be and that it doesn't serve anybody this right. isn't what it was supposed to be like it wasn't supposed to be that you know you could work there are people in our community who work full-time jobs more than one Absolutely. like job and are unable to meet their basic needs right. And what did they do wrong? They're, they're not lazy. Right. They're working harder than anybody. Often they're raising up kids. They've right. moved to this country. They've done all the things. And to be able to just acknowledge the unfairness of it right. all. The unfairness right. of, it, 
you know, the American dream, I think we were all pitched was that if you do your best, it'll be okay. And what happens if you, you know, for a lot of the young folks, like what happens if you're so buried under student debt and there's no jobs in the field and what do you do? Or if those jobs just decide not to pay you well and, and to own those things and, and to give space for people to be angry. James Baldwin has that quote I love, uh, you know, to be black in America is to be in a rage all the time. And I think we all experience that to degrees. Um, that this maddening experience of, oh, I'm just not good enough. Yeah. I'm just not going to get there and how heartbreaking that can be. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's really something. It's, so, so in doing this structural change, you know, I, I mean, it's just bigger than just crest. Yeah. It's bigger on every level. Yeah. Because you are changing also fundamental structural ideas that people have as well, like about homelessness or about mental health or about race, whatever it is. Yeah. You know, in, in the daily activities that you're doing, you are shaping and changing people's minds. And, and the more I learn about the history of Amherst, the more, the more I find that this is a place that always did this, that sent uh, black men from that community to the Civil War to fight and die alongside white men from that community. Mm -hmm. um, I would encourage anybody, the, the tablets, the Civil War tablets are, I, one of the first things I did was a tour of those and I do it again on about a monthly basis just because mm. it's so important to me to remember that, you know, again, I don't feel so alone when I realize that I'm building on top of a foundation yeah. that is older than the country. That town is older than this country, and it has made some mistakes, and it has not always got it right, but at its core, it has tried to be a good mm. place. And mm. uh, I like the idea of trying to make a place that wants to be a good place an even better place. That's fantastic. All right, well, we're coming to a close. I just, is there any last things that we didn't touch on or? Juneteenth is coming up. Yeah. We'll be in town all weekend. We'll be at the Jubilee on the 19th. Uh, encourage folks to come out. Uh, the History Walk on the 18th, you'll be able to see those tablets. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, just invite folks to come down to Amherst if you're not already there and, and reach out. My door is always open. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, you all. This you. is wonderful. And also thanks to Greenfield Community Television they are awesome and do a wonderful job and really help support my show. And if you'd like to see other Going Deeper episodes, you can do that uh, through marcysglobe.com. Okay, thanks. See you next time. Well, when I was a little boy sitting on said, son, let me tell you about that bad staggerly.